Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining in the Iowa Soybean Association's Continuity Through COVID-19 webinar. We're glad you have joined us today. My name is Aaron Putsey and I will be uh, serving as the host of our conversation today. I also serve as Senior Information and Education for the Iowa Soybean Association and look forward to um, uh, being your guide and taking part in our discussion today. The Iowa Soybean Association is indeed driven to deliver, and that means bringing you timely information like we are today to help with your on-farm decision-making. We know that it's been uh, it's a very challenging time uh, for agriculture and for soybean farmers, and we trust that the, uh, the information that we bring to you today will be of value to you in your farming operation. We are also part of a family, so if you're a soybean farmer tuning in here today and you'd like to validate or activate your farmer membership in the Iowa Soybean Association, we welcome you to do so. You can do that by just going to the homepage of IASoybeans.com and you'll see an icon on how you can join ISA there on the upper right hand corner of your landing page. We always want to uh, keep in touch with you. Uh, so that we can continue to bring these kinds of information and education opportunities to you. As promised, we've gathered a number of experts today to touch on a variety of very soybean-centric topics that are being impacted by the rise of COVID-19. Our guests will offer their insights and answer your questions. Uh, our one hour together is gonna be equally divided, 30 minutes for information sharing by our panelists, and then 30 minutes for your questions uh, and to get those questions answered. Uh, if you are joining us via computer or smartphone again and have any questions that you'd like to pose to the panelists uh, during the presentation, you're invited to share them. You can do so by accessing the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring that, um, that functionality during our visit today and we'll bring your questions directly to the panelists as we proceed. So let's get started with a welcome from Iowa Soybean Association President Tim Bardol. Uh, Tim farms near Rippey, uh, just about 40 miles or so north and west of Des Moines. And he will then pass it off to Iowa Soybean Association CEO Kirk Leeds for an overview of ISA's business continuity efforts. So with that, welcome Tim Bardol. The floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, first off, I want to welcome everybody. This has uh, definitely been a trying couple years and very, uh, very challenging at best. It, it's important <clears throat> to, uh, to talk to people, and this is a great way to get the experts at Iowa Soybean um, kind of out and questions answered and, and kind of hear what we do. The staff at Iowa Soybean is a fantastic, very talented staff. I know there's not a lot of people um, that has had the opportunity to really see everything that Iowa Soybean does. So with, with this webinar, you can see every aspect, policy, um, agronomy, trade, it's, you'll, you'll see what we do. So. Uh, it it's, has definitely been an honor to work with these people um, as president this year. They are very passionate about helping the soybean producers in Iowa to become more competitive. And now, Iowa Soybean CEO Kirk Leeds. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And President Bardol, as always, thank you for your leadership and, and for those kind comments and supportive comments. Uh, as many of you know, uh, I've been working for Iowa soybean farmers for a long time, now in my third decade, and clearly these are the most unusual times that any of us have ever experienced, and it has certainly caused us to, to have to make decisions on the fly and improvise and at the same time continue to try to get the work done that, that we have committed to do on, on your behalf as, as the soybean farmers of Iowa. Um, these are challenging times, and as Aaron has said and Tim are articulated as well, uh, we wanted to use a few minutes today to give you an update on, on what's going on and, and what's happening at the office. Uh, we're trying to balance uh, the ongoing needs for the work that needs to be done with obviously protecting 
and making sure that our staff and our volunteers are safe and are not being um, exposed to necessary risk as, as we move forward. I'm happy to say that as of today, uh, all of our employees are safe. Uh, we've had none of our employees or family members at this point, any of them been diagnosed with the virus. Uh, we have been working uh, to try to do our part to make sure that didn't happen for several, several weeks. We began having a conversation internally in February about a business continuity plan. Uh, some of us who have made multiple trips to China, and in fact, some of us were in Wuhan, China, I believe three years ago, uh, we knew that it was just a matter of time before this uh, virus was impacting the U.S. And so we began to, to plan about what that would look like if we had to shut down the organization and or uh, shut down the office. Uh, again, I'm happy to say that at this point, we've not had to fully implement that, that business plan. Uh, the office does remain open, although in a very limited way. Uh, an excess of 80% of our employees are working remotely. Uh, all of our employees certainly have the ability to do that, uh, some more than others. And there are some essential business services that are much more challenging to manage uh, remotely. And so we, we are, the office is open, but uh, very limited access to the building. And again, more than 80% of our folks are, are working remotely uh, every day. Um, we have been doing all of the customary things that all of us have been told to do with social distancing, um, in, in increased efforts at disinfecting. Our office is not only cleaned every day, but once a week we are uh, have a service that comes in and basically uh, sprays, or if you want to call it bombs, the entire office so that uh, we can do an even better job of controlling anything that might get in there. Uh, early or this month, we banned all out-of-state travel for our employees and for any of the volunteers on behalf of the organization. We've been implementing that over the last several weeks. Uh, we have eliminated the ability of our staff or volunteers to travel in the state of Iowa, except for some ongoing essential, uh, basically one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, as you will hear in this call, uh, we still have significant programs and activities that are getting ready to ramp up because of spring planting. Uh, as you know, we have a very extensive and progressive uh, research team on the water quality side, conservation, soil health, as well as various agronomy studies and practices and our producer services team as well. So we are doing the things we need to do to keep our team safe. Uh, we are doing the best we can on a day-to-day -day basis to continue to operate the organization and do the things we need to do. Of course, everything is subject to uh, an update by, by the governor and by other officials, and we will continue to do what we need to do to keep our team healthy and safe and, and try to avoid as best we can uh, the dangers from this virus. So again, I appreciate you being on today. Uh, I look forward to any questions that you may have. I would offer as always that if uh, you have a question that you want to deal directly with me, please reach out and I will be glad to either return your email or your phone call. Uh, with that, I turn it back to you, Aaron, so we can get into the program updates. Thanks again, everybody, for being on. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, President Bardol, for opening our conversation here this afternoon. We have divided our conversation today into three distinct parts. Uh, the first is no, uh, and the second is, under, is uh, understand. And we wanted to bring to you today um, the latest information regarding uh, markets and market development and also on the policy and regulatory front. There is a lot that impacts agriculture and soybean production as a result, again, of the rise of COVID-19. And we are going to begin the understand portion of our conversation today with Michael Dolch. Mike serves as Iowa Soybean Association Senior Director of Policy. And then he will hand it off to uh, Christy Seifert, who serves as the Executive Director of Government Affairs for the American Soybean Association. So Michael, we'll turn it over to you for the start of our um, understand portion of this call on policy and regulatory matters. Great, thanks so much, Aaron. Um, like those before me, I uh, do wanna extend appreciation to those who have joined us here today. I know it's an awfully busy time of the year and set to get busier. Uh, so grateful that you're spending some time with us to help understand uh, not only from a policy arena what's happening and how it's going to affect your operation, um, but also how we can transition and work through the current coronavirus outbreak. Um, as was mentioned, just as coronavirus changes and evolves, 
uh, so too uh, does the information, resources, and guidance from our state and federal agencies. And that's largely in part why we brought Christy Seifert and myself together to run down key legislative and regulatory actions, again, that are going to impact your operation and are already likely to be impacting your operation. Um, as we walk through this as well, be assured too uh, that we've been in constant contact and working very closely with Secretary Nag of the Iowa Department of Land, Ag and Land Stewardship, uh, close contact with the governor's office and our federal delegation to, uh, to ensure that your concerns are heard and obviously factored into the decisions that are being made and that are going to affect the available resources and support that's offered. Um, so diving in by now, you're probably aware uh, that the Iowa legislative session is under a temporary suspension until at least April 15th. But to put that into perspective, the legislative session started mid mid January and would have adjourned in a traditional year around April 21st. Um, so as it currently stands, uh, it looks to be uh, going to push well beyond that. Uh, before suspending, however, uh, the legislature did pass a measure that would fund state activity through the month of August. Um, and that's simply due to the fact that social distancing, we're hopeful it doesn't, uh, but could push deep, deeper into the calendar year. Uh, so to keep things operational and up and running from a state perspective. Uh, of course, and at least in the interim, advocacy, advocacy as we've traditionally known it has really changed. Uh, like all of us, legislators are really adapting to new norms uh, that come with working remotely and communicating by phone and email. Uh, to date, all folks have been really receptive. They've been really re uh, accessible uh, and responsive as well. Um, from my perspective moving forward, I don't feel the legislature again is as likely to reconvene on or around April 15th. So the big question mark going forward will be the budget and the state of Iowa budget. Uh, what's been the outbreak's impact on fiscal year 2020? What will it mean for FY 2021? Uh, these are some of the questions and considerations that legislators are really uh, touching on now and actively discussing uh, for when they come back and reconvene. Uh, quickly, too, I want to touch on the state public health emergency declaration and some of the regulatory re relief that that provided. Uh, so Governor Ed Reynolds did issue a state public health emergency declaration on March 17th. Uh, since then, she has signed a continuing proclamation uh, to strengthen the state's response through mid-April, April 15th. Um, of note, within that proclamation, uh, it did grant both an hours of service extension and a weight limit exemption. Uh, which basically allows trucks transporting ag commodities to haul up to 90,000 pounds on state roadways, again, excluding federal interstate um, pathways. Uh, the governor's proclamation also allowed Secretary Nag and IDOLS to extend the deadline for pesticide applicator renewals. Um, so anyone who was certified through December 31st of this last year, 2019, uh, can keep his or her current li license until December 31st, 2020, so of this year. Um, really quickly before I pass, pass the microphone, uh, again, just because the state legislature is suspended, it doesn't mean we're sitting idle at this point. Uh, with a lot of advocate membership support, we're still working those top line issues that, um, such as the Governor's Priority Invest in Iowa Act. Uh, we're also working uh, relentlessly on reauthorization of the biodiesel tax differential that Grant may touch on here shortly, um, which is set to expire on June 30th. Um, so yes, the new normal looks a little bit different and the traditional ways of advocacy and lobbying have changed, um, but albeit uh, business is continuing as usual and we're continuing that outreach. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot of the state level activity. Again, if you've got questions, feel free to drop those into the chat feature and look forward to addressing those here shortly. Um, but before that, wanna give um, get the latest out of Washington, D.C. Um, so it's my pleasure to hand it off to Christy Seifert. Uh, she's the Executive Director of Government Affairs with ASA. Christy, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Michael. And um, like you, in, in Washington, advocacy certainly has changed what it looks like anyway, but um, like you as well, we are not sit sitting idly by as, as we continue to um, engage in the COVID response and in other ways uh, on behalf of ASA members um, on our priority issues. So thank you for inviting me to share a federal perspective today. 
two weeks ago, ASA led a letter to President Trump asking the administration to be mindful of movement restrictions on agriculture, especially at this critical time of spring planting. Our letter was very well received by the White House, by USDA, and we were pleased to see food and ag designated as essential components of the workforce since. And actually, just in the last few days, we worked to ensure that the biodiesel industry was included in the most recent version of that um, essential workforce guidance. ASA has fielded questions, fielded concerns from members, from state staff on a variety of issues, including H-2A, input supply availability, transportation, CDL issues, you name it. We've shared those um, questions, concerns upstream um, where it made sense. And I have to compliment USDA on being highly responsive, highly accessible to our questions, which we have just truly appreciated. Um, ASA has established a small internal task force chaired by Kevin Scott uh, to facilitate information sharing from the field so that we in the D.C., um, I don't want to say office, the D.C. region right now, um, are, are equipped to share these stories, these questions and concerns with policymakers in the administration um, or uh, in Congress. ASA has shared, ASA will continue to share resources that may be helpful to states, to members. Um, recently, this included highlights of the third supplemental package passed by Congress and enacted by pre the President in recent days. Now for ag, this supplemental included a $14 billion replenishment of the USDA Commodity Credit Corporation, CCC fund. Um, of note, this is the same amount as the 2019 MFP total payment. Um, it also included a $9.5 billion uh, funding stream in a USDA account for relief. And this is largely considered a pot of money for specialty crop and livestock producers to have some level of assistance since they have not traditionally um, benefited from MFP. We fully expect that Congress will develop additional supplemental legislation in the coming weeks. Uh, we've actually had a couple of offices reach out to us about um, what might a fourth supplemental look like. Um, so I think that probably we've seen these three. We're seeing a four starting to get developed and, you know, may not stop at four just as this uh, situation continues to evolve. Um, but in addition to monitoring and engaging on the COVID response, just please know that our team remains laser focused on our ASA priorities, including trade, infrastructure, and biofuels and others. Uh, and also know that your Iowa team does an outstanding job in representing you and communicating with us in DC. Uh, I will turn it back to Erin at this time. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Michael. And as we move into the second part of the understand portion of our conversation, Jan, very pleased to say that we have more than 80 uh, participating in our webinar today. So thank you again for joining us. Again, if you have questions for any of the panelists as a question comes to mind, please do share it with us utilizing the Q&A function there at the bottom of your screen. Let's move right into an update on market development because we know that for uh, the industry and for our farmers, we have to be selling uh, and moving product. And with that, we have Grant Kimberly, uh, ISA Senior Director of Market Development, and also Jim Sutter, who serves as Executive Director of the U.S. Soybean Export Council. I will turn it over now to Grant. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, yes, on the demand side of things, uh, the good news is with uh, all the issues surrounding COVID-19 and, and everything else, people still have to eat. And so we're still seeing some positive signs on demand. I'll touch on biodiesel here first though, as Michael said, uh, one of the key issues we're working on here at the state level is to uh, extend the, the B11 tax differential that does expire at the end of June. So that's a high priority to get that passed. We're also working to, uh, find funding for the Renewable Fuel Infrastructure Program. It's a cost share program that provides uh, uh, infrastructure dollars to increase the usage of renewable fuels throughout the state of Iowa. 
um, and help build out the infrastructure. Um, the national issues, uh, of course, we've heard about the uh, small refinery exemptions. Those, there's recently been the Tenth Circuit Court ruling uh, where they ruled that a lot of those were given out illegally. Uh, and so the administration now just recently came out and said that they weren't going to challenge that ruling, but we still have work to do and we're still working through our partnerships at National Biodiesel Board and through our uh, congressional delegation to make sure that the administration follows through on that ruling and applies that nationally. If that's the case, then that would dramatically reduce the number of small refinery exemptions uh, granted and that would uh, help the biodiesel industry uh, quite a bit. Uh, from a pork uh, and meat export standpoint, uh, pork exports still remain very strong. Um, we are you know, experiencing increases so far this year, even record levels in some cases on it when it comes to pork exports. The strong markets right now include China, Japan, Australia, Chile, and the Philippines. Um, we're, we're seeing it actually as the second highest vo monthly volume uh, level on record as of this last January. And exports accounted for 29.8% uh, of total pork production up from 23.6% year over year. Um, there could be some disruptions down the road when it comes to the COVID-19, more so on uh, how plants are able to run, uh, port export terminals, uh, unloading, delays, things like that, that could cause some issues here down the road. We're not sure exactly how that's going to play out yet, but that's something that we'll have to continue to monitor and, and, and uh, work through our partnerships with the U.S. Meat Export Federation and also the USA Poultry and Egg Export Council. Uh, but both of them feel very optimistic that we're going to continue to see strong meat demand uh, for those various products. So with that, I would uh, introduce now Jim Sutter. Jim is the executive director of the U.S. Soybean Export Council. Jim will talk more specifically now about export and for soybeans and soybean meal exports and, and how COVID-19 uh, might be impacting some of those uh, markets around the world. Jim. Great. Thank you very much, Grant. And thanks to all of you for the continuing partnership that we enjoy with Iowa. You know, we are living through the situation of a lifetime. Only four months ago, we could have only imagined this was part of a movie, and now we're actually living through it. So uh, certainly something we're living from or learning from. The global priority is obviously containing this break, and our thoughts are with everyone who's been personally affected. And we're watching all of the guidelines very carefully to keep our teams safe around the world. Our St. Louis offices are doing much like the Iowa Soybean Group, working primarily remotely. Uh, our China office was doing that back in uh, February and uh, March, and is just now getting back into uh, more office, normal office operation. So we're monitoring that closely around the world. So fortunately, as, as Grant said, we are in the food business in one way or another, and people continue to need to eat. And I believe a situation like this highlights the need for strong and safe food supply chain, of which our U.S soybean export supply chain, all the way from the farm to the export locations to international buyers, is a key part and is well respected. The U.S. government has deemed agriculture as criti critical infrastructure. This designation helps minimize disruptions. Uh, currently, suppliers of U.S. soy, the exporters, the whole supply chain, they remain diligent in their efforts to market and export soy products globally. And as you know, 60% of our soy leaves, the soy, soy produced leaves the country in the form of exports, so it's critical that we keep this flowing. Our teams at USEC are engaged with FAS and uh, continuing to try and assure that these important inspection work that, uh, F that the various parts of USDA do in order to facilitate exports continues, and we continue to get assurances that they will continue doing that. So our worldwide team is very involved, uh, continuing to actively engage with stakeholders as we respond and adapt to this situation. We're implementing technological resources to facilitate stakeholder inter interaction. Uh, things like this, we're educating, uh, we're there to educate folks around the world about the availability and the security of U.S. soy. And as we hear potential problems with other origins, particularly in South America, and problems getting ships loaded and having their vessels leaving the port, we are continuing to promote the safety and the security and the reliability of U.S. soy. We're soon going to be announcing details around a series of virtual global seminars that we're going to be launching in April 
where we'll foster dialogue on the state of the U.S. soy market, the status of the supply chain, and how planting and growing is progressing. Tomorrow and Thursday are the first examples of these, then they'll be happening in China, where we'll be hosting two well-known market experts, Chinese experts, uh, for webcast meetings using Tencent technology, a technology that's common in China. So I'm really anxious to see how those turn out. We're getting a very good interest in sign up for those. In a couple of weeks, as I said, we're going to be hosting these global events, uh, and we're looking forward to a very large sign up for those. And we have some of our USEC board members and other grower leaders are going to be involved in that. Uh, teams across USEC and other regions are working to rework their programs and to think about how do we do more virtually. We can't just have postpone or delay everything. Uh, we need to get on with our work and, and, and learn how to reach people in different ways as we are doing. The export pace for U.S. soy is slightly ahead of last year, which is good. It's not where we'd like it to be, but it is slightly ahead of last year. Uh, many of you are watching closely to see about the phase one China deal. I think there's really good progress being made in terms of steps of implementation. Uh, what important was was getting the uh, tariff-free import waivers, which have largely been granted to importers. And now we are starting to see um, more talk and more steps taken on the implementation process. We'd all like to see purchases happening, but I think it's realistic we'll see these later in the calendar year rather than right now. Um, we also, one of the things that is concerning is we need a, we need a concerted effort to solve for the COVID-19 problem. And we certainly don't need any trade wars going on right now. You know, we start to see some people talking about this or that, uh, conflicts between the U.S. and China or the U.S. and other countries. And I certainly hope that we're able to keep those at bay and focus on solving the COVID problem, focus on getting global trade up and running so we can get economies back going again, so we can see continued demand growth. So just so you know, our team is working, continuing to work very hard around the world uh, differentiating, building a preference, and ensuring market access for U.S. soy, as we always do, and we're just learning how to do that in a different way. So thanks for the opportunity to be with all of you today, and I'll now turn it back to Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Grant. Um, now, as we transition to the ACT uh, part of our conversation today, we will have Ed Anderson join us. Ed serves as the Senior Director at Iowa Soybean Association. Uh, for our research uh, work. And uh, we wanted uh, Ed to come on board here and to share some insights from the ISA Research Center for Farming Innovation, including uh, opportunities for farmers to benefit from the work of the center as they prepare to begin uh, another growing season. Uh, again, just a reminder, do use your Q&A uh, icon there at the bottom of your screen. We have a couple of questions that have come in, so please keep them coming, and we'll get to them um, immediately following Ed's comments. So with that, Ed, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Aaron, and thank all the members of the uh, panel for some really great information. It's, it's uh, nice to go at the end here, having heard all of the good things that have been discussed already. I, too, want to thank all of the folks on the webinar today for taking time to uh, listen to what we have to say and engage in the ensuing conversation and, and Q&A that follows. I'll try and keep my uh, comments as, as brief as possible. Realize that ISA has a long and dedicated and sustained commitment to research. We support domestic and international demand for soy by working to ensure that we have the most abundant quality, highest quality and most reliable supply of soybeans on the planet. We further seek to provide data, information, and technical assistance to inform policy. And so there is a connection with everything we do with what you've heard to this point. We too understand and have to respond to the COVID-19 um, situation that we're in today, uh, both in our internal research programs and in the funded work that we do in partnership with universities across the, uh, across the Midwest. Um, many of those universities are experiencing shutdowns that impacts all of the faculty, staff, students, and, and uh, extension folks who are trying to do good work in a timely manner with a sense of urgency and accountability with and on behalf of our programs, uh, the various soybean programs across the country, uh, always with the mind on the farmer first. So if we think of the two 
areas of research that we focus on, our external programs and our internal programs. Aaron is absolutely correct. Uh, we wish to reassure all of you, and especially our farmer partners, um, that we, uh, on our staff, we in partnership with our farmers and we in partnership with the various university researchers and, and extension folks across Iowa and across the Midwest, certainly are focused on doing everything we can to support and enable farmers this growing season and beyond. Um, as most of you know, the general categories of research we do, whether we're talking about our internal programs or our externally funded programs, focus on the development and evaluation of new genetics. We're looking at new ways to manage old and new pests. Those include weeds, diseases, insects, drought, flooding, and a number of other uh, biotic and abiotic stressors. We're focused on improving and, and um, exercising everything we have at our disposal to assist farmers with agronomic and cropping systems improvements. We focus on data and scientifically sound research to provide information, recommendations, guides, and enhancements to all farming operations. We provide decision tools in the area of digital agriculture, linking everything we do. We're always focused on improving conservation practices or the best management of nutrients, for um, uh, providing soil conservation and soil health, water management and water quality. A clear focus on our farmer profits is what drives us every day. And this is what we iterate to all of our funded researchers externally as well. So um, without going into a whole lot of detail on the types of programs that you can engage with, I would encourage you please to make use of your telephone and call us to make use of your um, uh, web and computer capabilities. Um, you can find our information, contact people uh, by visiting www.iasoybeans.com and, and click on the uh, research tab. Um, you're always welcome to give me a call. I would encourage a call or an email. You can reach me at 515-334-1059 or eanderson at iasoybeans.com. And thank you again very much for your time and, and for all you do for um, all of us. Thank you very much, Ed, for the update on our research efforts at Iowa Soybean and how farmers can participate in those efforts. We have a number of questions that have come on in from those who are participating in today's webinar. The first, and not surprisingly, uh, has to do with a price outlook. Uh, I'm gonna maybe toss this over first to Kirk to maybe frame it up and then uh, Grant or Jim or others to weigh in as well. But the question is, uh, what do we uh, see in terms of this uh, ebb and flow uh, for soybean for prices here over the next one to two months? Uh, so Kirk, uh, pull out your uh, best uh, crystal ball here and, uh, and share what you know. Well, I'm certainly not going to deal directly with the price question, but I would say, um, and perhaps Jim Sutter would comment on this as well, I was on a call this morning with Jim uh, when he had his regional directors from all around the world, and, and in every case they were talking about the impacts on demand for soybeans around the world. Jim did, in your opening comments, Jim, you did comment that uh, we actually are above last year, but not where we want to be. So I think generally I would say, Aaron, that um, demand overall for soy at this point Point has not been dramatically impacted by virus. Uh, we're still feeding livestock. Uh, we're still doing the things that we do. Um, but certainly there are some concerns long term. Uh, thankfully, the uh, fall off in prices of oil have not impacted soy as much as they have impacted our corn side of our businesses. Uh, that will likely can, can, uh, continue to be a problem on the ethanol side, certainly. Uh, we did get the uh, updated numbers this morning from USDA. I think there was some surprise in those numbers uh, relative to how much soybeans versus corn in some of the markets, but overall, I think it's a mixed bag. So at this point, Aaron, I would respond that we've not seen uh, too much of a direct impact yet on soybeans. Uh, some of the farmers that I have talked to recently believe that there are probably more upsides for soybeans in this market than there perhaps is for corn at least in the short term as we get ready for the growing season. But maybe Jim Sutter, if you want to come in a little bit more about the conversation that took place this morning on your regional director's reports from around the world. 
Sure. Thank you very much. Um, and you are correct, Kirk, in our regional directors, and each of them gave a brief presentation of what they're seeing. Undoubtedly, we are seeing some slowdown in demand. In China, people stayed out of restaurants for six weeks, eight weeks, and are still not back in the numbers that they were normally in. And if you just go around the world, you can see the same sort of things happening. In some of the new um, expanding markets, Pakistan, Bangladesh, a couple of places where you just recently had some of your Iowa directors and team, um, I'm sure those places are seeing a slowdown in poultry consumption versus what they were seeing a few months ago. So that has a negative impact on demand. What I would say is perhaps the silver lining against that is that uh, the South American crop, which was expected to be a huge record, about 5% above last year's already uh, large record crop, has, has come down in size some recently. They've had some poor weather, so now it's just about unchanged versus last year. So we have a little bit less South American supply than, than we were thinking we were going to have to deal with. And uh, I, I think I mentioned the phase one China deal. You know, I think we're still optimistic that the phase one China uh, deal will move forward and it will result in large purchases of U.S. agricultural products in the second half of this year. And I think soybeans will be on the forefront of that. So if that happens, we should see soybeans get back to pre-tariff levels in terms of the volume that we ship into that market maybe even go above. I think the projections that we have internally, if they're going to reach this $40 billion on average purchase number for agricultural products, it's going to take a lot of soybeans because there won't be that many other things that can make up in terms of dollar value. So I think that's what we have to kind of look forward to. In fact, we've almost, we've been worrying that if we ship that many soybeans to China, will there be enough for the other markets that we've been working so hard to be cultivating? So when I see uh, acres at only 83 and a half million acres in the U.S., I'm a little disappointed because I think we're going to need more acres, although I know the market price signal is not there telling farmers to plant more soybeans necessarily. But I think a year or two down the road, when we get the COVID deal behind us, we get the phase one deal being implemented, and if we get these other markets back on track, I think we can certainly be needing more acres than we have today. So it's a long-winded uh, response, but, uh, but I do, in the longer term, I'm optimistic because people still want protein and cooking oil and soybeans deliver that. Thank you. Over. Uh, this is Grant. I guess one other thing I would add uh, with the recent changes in the marketplace, the, the oil price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia, and of course the COVID-19 impacts, the ethanol industry is is uh, experiencing some major difficulty and challenges now with uh, reduction of gasoline demand. Um, and so what we are hearing is that possibly one third of the ethanol industry plant capacity will go idle for a period of time. That means less DDGs will be then produced, which should also mean an increase in demand for soybean meal. Uh, so there might be some temporary gains at least uh, from the soybean meal uh, demand side of things, both domestically and internationally, uh, due to some of those other impacts. Um, and so we'll have to wait and see how the, all that plays out. But certainly I think based off of the, the report that came out from USDA today, I think you can write that in pencil uh, because I think there's people going to be reevaluating their acreage mix uh, at this point going forward. Remember that survey was taken the 1st of March uh, and so I think we might see soybeans being um, a bit more competitive down the road here uh, once the market uh, starts to take all that into consideration and look at the corn versus the soybean longer term de demand picture. Over. Thank you, Grant, and uh, as well as Jim and Kirk for your insights there. Let's go on to another question. Um, if Governor Reynolds issues a shelter in place, Will farmers need to have a letter assuring officials of their farming occupation? Um, there's some uh, people are hearing of, of some people that are being stopped in Minnesota. So I guess the question is if we do need something um, to make sure that um, farmers are recognized and identified, is there anything that farmers obtain? So I'll, I'll uh, again kick that over to uh, maybe um, either Michael or Christy uh, or Grant, any response to that question? 
Sure. Thanks so much, Aaron. This is Michael, and I'll start answering the question and defer uh, maybe to Christy, uh, Kirk, or Grant as well. Um, but for the folks on the line today, currently Iowa is not in a shelter in place situation um, until we cross that road. And I know the governor is very cautious while she's balancing uh, economy versus public health, uh, making sure um, everything is prioritized as it should be. Um, and there are a lot of questions and a very few answers based on the what ifs and speculation at this point. Uh, shelter in place orders, they're generally, they generally would close all non-essential businesses, um, though the definition of essential and non-essential varies uh, depending on the order in and of itself. And from the federal level down, the administration, they recognized agriculture as critical infrastructure. I would imagine that any order put in place by Governor Reynolds um, would follow suit, making farmers and the agricultural industry uh, essential. Um, now to the specific question about what identification or letter would be required, um, if that were put into place, the governor would of course issue guidance to accompany that. And, and that's something that we'll be watching very closely should that happen and be sure to share that with producers going forward. Uh, Michael, this is Kirk, and before maybe Christy answers at a federal level, this actually did come up in a conversation uh, with Secretary of Ag, Iowa Secretary of Ag, in uh, commodity groups talking about this. Um, at this point, as Michael said, the governor doesn't anticipate um, issuing such a, a recommendation. Agriculture will certainly be excluded, as we know, as defined as an essential service, as we know. I, I would say that there are <clears throat> industry partners, uh, particularly on the livestock side, that have already prepared uh, letters that their their staff have with them. So if they're out visiting um, uh, livestock producers and some of these integrated systems, that they have letters with them in their, the cabs of their trucks, uh, so that if they do get stopped, that they have letters explaining they're part of the essential food system. I would anticipate that if indeed we got to this point, there would be some, as Michael said, some regulations. It's probably not going to be a letter or some kind of paperwork. It's probably going to be a definition that law enforcement officers will have to uh, help interpret. So anyway, um, at this point, we have not seen it. We hope it doesn't happen. But again, industry, at least some of the industry are preparing for such an announcement, either federally or at the state level. Christy, you have anything at the national? Sure, sure, and I appreciate that. I think very importantly, the, the guidance regarding the essential workforce, the critical infrastructure piece um, that we've, we've kind of referenced reference to so far, that language, that document is federal guidance. And so it is up to states, it is up to localities to write those rules and refine that guidance for each um, state. I see that Gary Wheeler has included in the chat how Missouri is um, managing this. I, I think that probably every state may have a different approach. So as Michael mentioned, I think make sure that you see what that guidance looks like if it happens. But I have heard of some states um, either having some type of letter, some type of um, documentation, some type of even reference to the DHS guidance, just the printout of food and ag um, listed um, industries or jobs um, that, that the guidance applies to. Here in Virginia, where I live, um, we just received word of our own shelter in place yesterday through June 10th. And uh, we were told that if, if you're out uh, violating the, the order, all the guidance of the order, you can get a $2,500 ticket. So um, if I have to go out and get back into uh, the DC office, uh, which I hope I don't have to do, but if that happens, I will probably print something out just to have that um, reference if needed. If I could, this is, this is Ed. This, this response is going to be a little bit peripheral to the, to the foundational question that was asked, but from a research standpoint, especially focusing on our internal programs, as, and as Aaron mentioned, uh, the Iowa Soybean Association Research Center for Farming Innovation, we're committed to still being out on the, in the countryside working with farmers. Um, we're practicing um, you know, very, very small group interactions. We're, we're practicing the over the hood type distance approach and interacting with farmers, but remember, um, even if we were to shelter in place, 
Uh, a lot of our research programs, since they're done uh, with farmers using their land, their equipment, and, and um, their labor largely, uh, we can do a lot of this remotely. And um, those programs in fertility and fertilizers, agronomy and cropping systems, pesticides, manure management, biologicals, other things like that are, are still critically important for the short and long term to benefit farmers. So um, take heart. Uh, we can do a lot of this stuff remotely should we uh, go to a shelter in place uh, situation. Thank you, Ed. Um, moving on to uh, next question, um, seeking some insight. Um, it's been heard that Battelle in Ohio has developed a mask sterilization device. Uh, and the, uh, the question is, is this the same company that has also done soybean related research in the past. So I'll flip that over to either Ed or Kirk. Uh, any information or knowledge with regards to the Battelle company? I'm not familiar with the, the specifics of the question. That certainly is encouraging. But yes, ISA and other soybean organizations have done a fair amount of work with the Battelle organization. Battelle is an independent, uh, not-for-profit research facility in Ohio. Uh, that has done all kinds of work on industry. Um, it's, it's a very sophisticated, very extensive operation. Uh, they have done a number of uh, projects with soybeans, but I'm not at all familiar with the, this mask sterilization. That's a great question. I'm sure if we reached out to our friends in Ohio, they could answer that or perhaps someone at the United Soybean Board. But uh, we can check on that, but we have done work with them, but I'm not familiar with this particular um, story or report. Yeah, well, well put from my perspective. I don't have anything to add to that, Aaron. Have an email here, um, and I'm going to kick this over to uh, Grant. So we've seen what's been happening in the fuel market uh, and the uh, the the spillover uh, from the uh, the decline in oil to ethanol, and then uh, the impact it's having on biodiesel and on our biodiesel facilities. Um, what can you share with the group? What do you know um, in the area of energy uh, that uh, you want farmers to know as they're uh, getting ready to head to the field? Well, I mean, certainly there has been impacts to the biodiesel industry, although I would say it's not been nearly as severe as it's been to the ethanol industry because uh, diesel is commercial fuel. It's part of the vital industries, critical industries and critical infrastructure that's still in place. Uh, trucking industry, shipping and restocking the shelves at the grocery stores, at the retail level, uh, that's still occurring. And we also have construction that's still occurring and road work that's still occurring and will soon be in the fields. And so we'll have more agriculture usage of diesel. So overall biodiesel demand should still be good. Now the margins are not very uh, attractive right now. The RFS has been impacted a little bit with the RIN values, the renewable identification number values uh, on those credits. Uh, and so that's a challenge. The biodiesel industry has not yet received its uh, payments for the tax credit that was passed at the end of last year. Although I have heard just this week that some of those are just starting to come out. So hopefully in the next few weeks, the biodiesel plants will start uh, being able to uh, receive some of those tax credit payments that lapsed for the last two years uh, because that's caused cash flow uh, issues for the industry, which has uh, limited them on how they can purchase feedstocks and, and process and so forth. So they're running at lower levels because of that. In the longer term, the demand still looks really good um, because of all the factors I mentioned on strong diesel demand. As far as using biodiesel uh, this spring, it's, it's a great product, of course. We know it adds lubricity to diesel fuel. It reduces our greenhouse gas emissions. And um, recent research has shown that biodiesel adds over a dollar a bushel to the price of soybeans. So it's a great value added product. It also reduces the price of soybean meal uh, because we can process more soybeans because we've raised the value of the oil. We, and then we make more soybean meals. So we've lowered the cost of soybean meals, which is good for the livestock industry. So there's a lot of good benefits and there's a lot of good reasons why we need to continue to support that industry and, and grow that industry. Thank you, Grant. So I have a, an observation and a question. The first is an observation that um, regarding any possible disruptions 
in the supply chain for soybean production as we get ready to plant. Uh, we just encourage farmers, if they do have any issues with the supply chain or if they hear of any credible issues regarding the supply chain as we move into the planting season, the Iowa Soybean Association would like to be aware and informed of those issues. We will go to work on those issues to remedy them if there are. So please keep in touch with us. Um, keep us posted on any issues related to the planting of your soybean crop. And we do want to be aware of any supply chain issues that may arise. Uh, one other question, and again, we touched on this briefly. I know, Jim, you hit on this, and uh, Kirk, you did as well. Uh, but our question, uh, when, if or when, do you believe that we will return to the pre-tariff levels of soybean exports to China? So who of you would like to take a swing uh, at that question? I defer to you, Mr. Sutter. Well, as I said, I think if phase one is successfully implemented, and I think we're on a good path to do that, I think both the Chinese and the U.S. are continuing to work in good faith, even during this COVID pandemic, uh, to, to put the steps in place so it can really be implemented successfully. I think in order for the, uh, for the Chinese to achieve their $40 billion on average over two years purchase target, I think they will have to purchase uh, a large quantity of soybeans. So provided we have the supply available, I think we will exceed the pre-tariff levels as phase one gets implemented. I think, uh, you know, we'd all like to be seeing it happen today, but we're right now in the face of a huge harvest in South America, not as big as we thought it was going to be, but a big harvest and a record low Brazilian real versus the U.S. dollar. So there's lots of front end selling pressure coming from South America. The bad news is there's a lot of front end selling pressure. The good news is they can only sell once. So as we get into the second half of the year, I think the U.S. will become uh, more called upon. And as the Chinese need to step up their buying pace, I think we'll have a good chance uh, in the years to come to exceed the pre-tariff uh, pre levels. Over. We have a question for Ed. So Ed, as farmers are preparing to uh, plant this year's uh, crop, what are you hearing in terms of any pest or disease pressures? Perhaps they were those that um, reared their heads uh, last year that uh, farmers should be on the lookout uh, here as they prepare to go to the fields this spring. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for the question. So um, the only thing specifically that we've heard much about is the uh, expansion of the soybean gall midge um, starting in the Missouri River Valley and, and making its way um, east and west from there. Um, other than that, I would say uh, keep a close eye on environmental conditions, the amount of moisture we get, the temperatures we have. Um, everything out there uh, overwintered pretty well, both pathogens and insects. Um, weed issues and herbicide resistant weeds are, are certainly always a, a concern. Um, farmers have no small task in trying to manage all of the, uh, the yield robbers that exist. Um, but I would say uh, the, only, the only specific thing we've been hearing about is the expansion of gall midge. There's a lot of good research being funded by checkoff dollars. There's a lot of good work being done to try and understand the life cycle of that insect pest and try to manage it uh, more efficiently uh, with more answers. Um, diseases, again, if it's, if it's uh, cool and wet, we're going to have some uh, pathogen problems. If it's warm and wet, we're going to have other pathogen problems. Um, just keep an eye, be willing to scout your fields and, and uh, work to manage um, all, of the, all of the challenges with very integrated approaches. Thank you, Ed. We're gonna have a closing uh, comment and a wrap here from uh, both uh, President Bardol as well as uh, Kirk Leeds. Before we do, I would like to just thank all of you for participating today. And again, we're a family here in the soybean industry and we want to know and we want to engage with you. Um, as farmers, again, please go to iasoybeans.com and just activate and validate it. No additional cost to your uh, investment in the checkoff. You can be a farmer member of Iowa Soybean. 
we want to engage with you, we want to interact with you, and we want to know how we can best serve you. So please go to IASoybeans.com and how I can join is right there. It's a very painless uh, process and we will protect your uh, anonymity and your information that you share with us so that we can be of greater service to you. President Bardol, I'd like to just uh, ask for you uh, to offer any closing comments that you may have. Yes, yeah, so well, um, thank you for everybody taking the time to, uh, to spend with us here this noon. It's important for, for the information and the stuff that the Iowa Soybean Association does to get, to get out into farmers' hands. And, and those that are very active and engaged with Iowa Soybean uh, knows what a lot of what we do. And hopefully some that aren't as engaged have been on this and, and see the, the scope of what Iowa Soybean does. And when you have questions, you know, the, the people at the Iowa Soybean Association are there for you. So don't hesitate to call and ask. Thank you. So let me just uh, add to that. Thank you, President Bardol, for your comments and for your ongoing leadership. Uh, thank you to Christy and Jim for joining us on this, on this uh, webinar. We appreciate you joining. We appreciate the work of the American Soybean Association and the United Soybean Board, as well as the U.S. Soybean Export Council. You're, you're good partners and valued partners. And, and these trying times more than ever, we need to make sure that we continue to communicate and, and work together. For the rest of you, uh, as we said, please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, we are actively engaged with lots of government officials and they do wanna know if you're experiencing troubles uh, getting through various issues. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. To everyone else, please stay safe. Uh, do what you're supposed to do and, and follow the guidelines. Uh, stay safe so that we can uh, all get together at some point and celebrate better days. So Aaron, thank you for your leadership and uh, hosting this call. Everyone else, take Take care and God bless. Thank you. I will echo those comments. Again, stay engaged with Iowa Soybean. You can do so at IASoybeans.com. We'd like to offer future webinars. So please take a minute to respond to the evaluation uh, that you receive. Um, we welcome your response. We'd like to do more of these as um, we all head our uh, different ways. We want to keep engaged and in touch. And this is a great way to do that, uh, as well as uh, we will be providing a recorded version of this webinar. It will be available uh, tomorrow. We will send it out to those who are participating. Please share it with others you may know. We'll also make it available on our many social media channels as well. So with that, be safe, uh, be well, everyone. And thank you for your engagement with the Iowa Soybean Association. Have a good day.